Welcome to Morbidology. I'm your host, Emily G. Thompson, author of Unsolved Child Murders, Cults Uncovered, Mysteries Uncovered, and co-author of Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. Join Morbidology on Patreon for exclusive episodes of Morbidology Plus, exclusive merch, ad-free and early release episodes, and much more. It's estimated that around 35 Australians go missing each year. That's a startling one every 15 minutes. More than half of those that go missing are under 18 years old, while the majority turn up after hours, days, weeks, or even months. There's a handful that never turn up again, that vanish without a trace. In summer of 2011, a teenage girl vanished in Baronia, Australia, on the way to school. The subsequent search for the teenage girl would become one of the state's most baffling cases and led to many in the nation questioning whether a dormant child predator had come back for another victim after a 20-year respite. Bong Siraboon was a 13-year-old girl from Baronia, which is a suburb of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. The Siraboon family consisted of Bong, her 20-year-old sister, Pang, her mother, Vanita, and her stepfather, Fred Patterson. Vanita and Bong's father had separated and she had married Fred back in 2004. While Bong and Pang were not his biological daughters, he treated them as though they were. The family were originally from Thailand, but in 2008 they moved over to Australia, where Bong had adapted well. Bong was a student at Baronia Heights College, which was just a short walk away from where the family lived. Here, Bong made friends easily. She couldn't speak English fluently, but she was learning, and she could speak it conversationally. She excelled in school and she had tight connections to the community through her love of dancing and sports. Bong had been a member of the Knox United Performers, which were a dance group, and she was in the process of learning Korean. Bong was described as a normal, happy girl from an average Australian family. As Fred said, it's a happy house. We rather tell than yell. All of the family had held strong Buddhist beliefs. Bong was a very caring young girl and very compassionate as well. The family loved to travel, especially back to Thailand, where Bong, her mother and her sister were from. The 2nd of June 2011 started out like any regular day for Bong. At around 8.30am, she said goodbye to her family and set off to walk the short distance to school. Bong was a student at the nearby Baronia Heights College and each morning, Bong would walk the same 10-minute route to school. And this day should have been no different. Bung crossed the street over to the footpath and walked in the direction of her school. A neighbour three doors up would see Bung walk past her home, as she did most mornings. That afternoon, however, Bung didn't return home from school. And at around 4.30pm, Vanita and Fred reported her missing to Baronia police. They had only been made aware that Bung was missing when her friend, Diami, called them up and asked them to remind Bung that she had a football game the next day. Fred questioned. Why didn't you tell her that in school today? Her friend replied, She wasn't at school today. Panic immediately set in, and Fred drove straight to the school where they were informed that Bung hadn't arrived to class that morning. Bung was so trustworthy that they simply thought she must have been in bed sick, so they didn't think to call up her parents and inquire. Vanita and Fred quickly got to printing out missing person posters of Bung and plastered them throughout Baronia. The last time that they had seen Bong, she was wearing her blue and white school uniform as well as a raincoat. She had also been carrying a backpack. Bong was described as standing at around 154 centimetres tall, with long black hair and of slim build. Fred described his stepdaughter as being gentle and shy, adding that she cared deeply about the feelings of others. He appealed to his daughter, stating, If she has problems or anything she's dealing with, we want her to know she can talk to us about it. Baronia Police Sergeant Cameron Hunt urged the public to keep an eye open for Bung. He said that while Bung was exceptionally close with her parents, he had not ruled out that she had not run away. However, Bung had never run away from home before. 
He said that they were concerned because of this and because Bong was only 13 years old. The first point of action for investigators was to try and retrace Bong's last known movements. They would confirm two reported potential sightings of Bong from the day that she vanished. At some point after 8am, she was seen near Baronia Heights College on Mount View Road. Then at around 3.20pm, she was seen walking down Chandler Road towards Dorset Road. Other than this, no immediate reported sightings of Bung came in. As news of Bung's disappearance swept throughout the community, the rumour mill was running rampant. There was much speculation, especially online, that Bung had been abducted. Detective Ian Brown said in the media that while theories were being thrown around, there was no evidence to indicate that Bung had been abducted, but that was certainly something they were looking into. They could not rule out that Bung had been abducted, nor could they rule out that she had left on her own accord. Bung's computer had been removed from the family home and analysed. There had been a fear that maybe Bung was speaking to somebody online and had arranged to meet up with them but her computer produced no leads or clues as to where she had gone. While typically when somebody goes missing, investigators would be able to trace them via their mobile phone, at least if it's turned on, because it pings to cell phone towers nearby, which would then show where in the general area they are. However, on the morning the Bung left for school, she had left her mobile phone at home. Investigators would set up an information caravan, which they rotated across Baronia Station, Albert Avenue and Baronia Mall. It was hoped that somebody would come to the caravan with some information that could assist in their investigation. The days would pass with no new developments in the case and fear for Bong's welfare escalated with each passing day. Fred would tell the Herald Sun that the family's strong Buddhist faith was keeping them hopeful that Bong was safe and well. He said that when you lose your beliefs, then you're no good to anybody. The family were keeping at bay the terrifying prospect that something sinister had happened to Bung, with Fred stating, We can't go down that track yet. If we think like that, we become useless. Bung's family said that they did not believe that she had simply run away from home. As mentioned before, she had never run away from home before. She was very close with her family and she had left her mobile phone at home. They said that there was no indication that she was planning on going anywhere in the days leading up to her disappearance with Fred stating, We hope if she is with someone, they're taking care of her as we would at home. We're a family. We love her. She's deeply missed. Days eventually turned to weeks, and investigators would try a new tactic to produce some leads. At the information caravan, they set up a mannequin to show what Bung was wearing at the time she vanished. It was hoped that the mannequin could potentially refresh someone's mind, make them think back to the morning of the 2nd of June. There were numerous events that had passed that Bong had been looking forward to, making the outcome look even bleaker. According to her family, Bong was excited about a school football match and a Rock I Steadford practice that had taken place on the 5th of June. Meanwhile, back at Baronia Heights College where Bong was a student, her disappearance was taking a toll on the other students. Principal Kate Hornetti said, It's been incredibly stressful. A missing child increases the anxiety levels of children and parents. The fear that Bung had been abducted quivered in the air, and parents of Baronia were afraid to let their children walk to school, with many opting to drive them right to the front gates themselves. Other children in the community were terrified that a predator was prowling the streets. Some were even too scared to sleep at night. Now, while it was originally reported in the media that Bung's computer had been searched and turned up no clues, That would change on the 16th of June when it began being reported in the media that Bong had a secret online life that was now being probed by investigators. While Bong had a regular Facebook profile, she also had two others in which she had used false identities. Bong's mother and stepfather had expressed fear about her online activity in the lead-up to her disappearance and made sure to tell investigators this. Investigators were wanting to examine all three Facebook accounts to see who Bung had been in contact with before her disappearance. She had been an extensive social media user. While the disappearance of Bung had initially been looked at as a missing person case, after two weeks, homicide detectives were brought in. The outcome wasn't looking good when they announced that they were going to be searching a specific area 
of Baronia, near the foothills of the Dandenong Ranges. They were also heading back to the Baronia Heights College to search for any potential clues, as well as knocking on doors of the residents who lived in the vicinity of the school to see if any of them had seen Bung. Investigators were additionally retracing Bung's steps, walking the same route she would have walked to school. It should have only been a ten-minute walk, but somewhere along the way Bung had vanished into thin air. Detective David Snare announced the search to the public and said that suggestions that Bung had been met with foul play were premature, stating, At this stage, it's too early in the investigation to speculate on what's occurred. Bung's family were still holding on to the hope that Bung was still alive. Fred said to the Herald Sun, We feel it in our hearts she's still with us. We've done everything we can. If anyone has any information, please come forward. By the end of week two of the search, investigators had questioned around 500 residents of Baronia, yet they were still no closer to uncovering what happened to Bung than they were on day one. Homicide Squad Detective Sergeant David Snare would hold a public police media briefing in which he implored the public to come forward with any information, regardless of how insignificant they thought it might have been. He said, I am concerned that a 13-year-old who leaves home without any funds or any other belongings with her, is out and about. Like most children of that age, they're involved in social networking sites. We are currently investigating the matter at this stage, and we still have not come to any conclusion. He said that they were still interviewing everybody who knew Bung, but admitted that he thought they would have known more by now. A couple of days later, investigators would announce that they had ruled out the significance of Bung's online double life. While Bung had three Facebook accounts, two of which were fake profiles, there was nothing on those profiles to indicate that anything sinister was taking place. However, they announced that they were now even more concerned that Bung had been abducted on the way to school. The day after this announcement, an even more ominous announcement was made by the investigators. Detective Inspector Ian Potter said that the homicide unit was taking more of a lead in the case because they thought it seemed more and more likely, as the days passed, that Bong had been abducted and killed. He said, We've got to look at that. We've become involved from day one in the monitoring sense. We see this as a suspicious missing person. A girl, 13 years of age, walking to school, doesn't arrive at school, and has never been seen of since. While this was an angle they were looking at, they announced that they did not believe that Vanita or Fred were involved in their daughter's disappearance. When a child goes missing, the parents are always among the first to be investigated. Moreover, they had ruled out an earlier sighting of Bung. Somebody believed that they saw Bung after 3pm on the day that she disappeared. But now, the last known sighting of Bung had come from the neighbour who saw her walking to school. She'd left the family home that morning safe and well and vanished somewhere on that 10-minute walk to school. While investigators were anticipating the worst, Bung's family were still clinging on to the hope that she was alive and well. They were interviewed by the Herald Sun, and they said, There's absolutely nothing to suggest at this stage that she has been hurt or come to any harm. Until we have evidence that that is the case, we will continue to believe she is alive and well. They said that hope was all the family had right now, and they were refusing to think negatively when there was no evidence to indicate that Bung had been harmed. The family had been truly proactive in the search for Bung, plastering her missing person poster throughout Baronia. The next point of action would be for those missing person posters to be placed on buses, trains and trams. The family were also physically searching for Bung each and every day. They got up each morning and searched throughout the area, going from house to house. Fred said, There's not a car that drives past that we do not look into, just hoping to see Bung. We have another daughter who needs looking after. Life is going on, but we are living a nightmare. I don't know if she has just gone off or is being looked after by someone, but we just want her home. On the morning of the 29th of June, almost a month after Bung vanished, an unidentified 11-year-old girl was walking to school along Bennett Street in Baronia. It was around 8.45am when a man pulled up alongside her in a dark green Holden station wagon. His face 
was covered with surgical mask and he was wearing dark track pants, a dark long sleeve top, and glasses. He was estimated to be in his 60s. He asked the girl to get into his car and she refused before getting out her mobile phone, which scared him off. Investigators working on Bung's disappearance asked the public to come forward if they had seen the man in question and asked the man to come forward and identify himself. This attempted abduction had taken place just a couple of streets away from where Bung was last seen and the immediate fear was that, of course, a child predator was lurking the streets. Could this man have abducted Bung and, if so, what had he done with her? In addition to investigating whether these two cases were linked, Investigators were also investigating whether Bung's disappearance could somehow be connected to the 1991 abduction and murder of 13-year-old Carmaine Chan. Carmaine had been abducted from her home in Templestowe, Victoria, by a man wearing a balaclava. Before fleeing the home with Carmaine, the killer had spray-painted Asian drug deal, payback, more to come, on the family's vehicle in the front drive. The following year, Carmaine's remains were found in a landfill in Thomastown. She had been shot in the head. In Carmaine's case, the main suspect was Mr. Krull, who is an unidentified child rapist and killer who attacked three girls in the northern and eastern suburbs of Melbourne in the late 1980s and early 1990s, as well as the murder of Carmaine. There were a number of young female victims uh, that were abducted from their homes, assaulted, uh, and that was co- that culminated in the final victim being Carmen Tran, where she was murdered. The murder of Carmaine was something that investigators were looking into to see if there were any similarities, but Detective Inspector Potter said that he didn't believe that there was any connection. It had been 20 years since Carmaine was killed. Investigators, however, did believe that there were similarities between Bong's disappearance and the attempted abduction of the 11-year-old girl. Both Bung and the girl were of Asian appearance, and they were both walking to school alone in the general vicinity of one another. With the disturbing development, parents would gather at Baronia Heights College to speak about safety of their children. They released some safety tips which encouraged children to walk to school in pairs, always carry a mobile phone, and call 000 or their parents if they ever felt in danger. Be aware of their surroundings talk to a parent or teacher if they felt unsafe. Listen to body signals that they feel unsafe. Have somebody on speed dial. Walk in visible areas and tell adults where they are going at any given time. Many children in the area walk to school alone in the morning, and understandably, parents and children were terrified. Penny Staff, whose daughter had been in Bung's class, said that she wouldn't let her children play outside anymore, while Jody Merkiv, said that her own daughter was too scared to take the bin out. Police patrols in the area had been ramped up to protect the local children, while other police officers were working closely with local schools to try and educate children on safety, as well as to try and uncover any fresh leads. The two cases were eerily similar, and Detective Inspector Potter announced that they were going to be looking into all recent abduction attempts, not just in Baronia, but as far as Frankston. He said that it was possible that one man was responsible for the disappearance of Bung, as well as the abduction attempt, stating, I don't think there's a massive number, but we are certainly aware that there are some. In addition to the 11-year-old girl who was almost abducted, investigators would find out that there was another attempted abduction the week before this attempted abduction. It had taken place around 4.30pm the week beforehand. A teenage girl had come forward, to reveal that she had been walking alone along Bedford Road when she spotted an early model light blue car pulled up on the curb. There was a man inside the car and he signalled to the 16-year-old girl to get inside the car, but she ignored him and continued walking. However, this man jumped out of his car and grabbed the girl's arm from behind. She managed to fight him off and she hid in some bushes until he finally drove away. The girl would describe the man in the car as being of Southern European appearance. She estimated that he was between 50 to 60 years old and around 178 centimetres tall, with average build and rotten teeth. He was dressed in dark clothing. Investigators said that they didn't believe that this attempted abduction was linked to the other one. While the descriptions of the men were somewhat similar, 
there were some differences. In particular, the time the attempted abductions had taken place and the car that was used. Back in February, around four months before Bong had vanished, an elderly woman in Clayton had been attacked. The woman had been abducted by an unidentified man and subjected to a sexual assault during an hour-long ordeal. An e-fit image of the attacker had been released back in March and it bore striking similarities to the e-fit of the man who had attempted to abduct the 11-year-old girl. Investigators were wanting to investigate this disturbing crime to see if there could be any links to Bung's disappearance as well as to the attempted abduction. The recent developments were extremely ominous, but Bung's family were still holding out hope that she was alive. Fred said that they were not focusing on the attempted abduction of the 11-year-old girl or the other cases which could somehow be linked, and instead still believed that Bung was alive and well. He said, We miss her and we want her back home. We want to stay positive and that's what we're going to do. Investigators stressed that while there were similarities, it still hadn't been determined if any of the cases were somehow linked. In early July, investigators working on Bung's disappearance started looking at brothels out of fear that Bung had been abducted and trafficked. They were also looking at all local sex offenders and gradually ruling them out of the inquiry. Meanwhile, Bung's mother, Vernita, returned to Thailand. The family owned property over there and Fred said that the trip had been planned for over a year. He said, She needs a break. We have plans to go to Thailand. Life can't stop. Stuff gets out of hand and it gets messier. We have a house over there and land interests and family. He said that Bung's disappearance had hit the family hard, but it had really taken its toll on Vanita. There was an unexpected update on the case on the 7th of July, when the 11-year-old girl who claimed that a masked man had attempted to abduct her admitted that she had made the entire story up. She apologised to investigators, who had been working tirelessly around the clock. Her lies had completely transformed the investigation with investigators believing that they had a suspect car and a suspect description to work on. By now, they had ruled out that Bung's disappearance was linked to the attempted abduction of the other girl and the sexual assault on the elderly woman. They were now back at square one. While Detective Inspector Potter had initially said he didn't think that there were any links between Bung's disappearance and the murder of Carmine 20 years ago, It was disclosed that this was still an angle investigators were looking at, with Detective Inspector Potter now saying that Bung had disappeared with replications of what had happened to Carmine all those years ago. He announced that they were looking into several past cases, including those of the infamous Mr. Krull, who was never caught. He said, There are aspects in this case that happened with Mr. Krull 20 years ago. We are looking at the replications with Carmine Chan. Bong is Asian, the same age, and it happened in the eastern suburbs. At this stage, there is no direct link, but we will continue to look at persons of interest. In mid-July, local police implemented Operation School Safe, which would focus on school safety. There was a 40 km per hour speed zone put in place, as well as child drop-offs and pickups. There was also an increased police presence around schools to alleviate concerns of parents and students. Safety House committees also announced that they were seeking more volunteers to sign up in Baronia. The Safety House programme was designed for the safety of children while going to and from school. Houses and businesses are selected to become designated safe places for children to seek shelter and safety if they needed it. By August, investigators searching for Bung would admit that they had no suspects, no sightings and no strong leads. 64 days had passed since Bung had vanished and they admitted that they were no closer to finding her than they were on day one. Fred would launch a fresh appeal for information, telling the public, somebody out there knows what's happened here and we are desperate for that person to come forward. People don't just vanish off the face of the earth. He said that the family were praying for Bong every morning and night and were remaining hopeful. Investigators would announce that they believed that Bong must have been abducted because she vanished without a trace. They announced that they did not believe that Bong had arranged to meet somebody that day, nor did they believe that her mother, her stepfather or her biological father in Thailand was involved in any way. 
They were working on the theory that Bong was abducted in the street as she walked to school. While the 11-year-old girl had lied about the attempted abduction and had diverted investigators, it had also led to around 300 tips, some of which could have assisted in Bung's disappearance. By October, investigators had questioned and verified the alibis of almost 100 registered sex offenders in the area as the search for Bung continued. They had also reviewed all available CCTV in the area where Bung had disappeared and received around 500 calls overall to Crime Stoppers. Nevertheless, there had been no concrete line of inquiry. Around Halloween time, a special police task force was established to investigate Bung's disappearance. Task Force Puma, which was to be led by homicide detective Sergeant David Snare, would be exclusively investigating the case, and it would consist of members of the Victoria Police Crime Department, regional police and tactical intelligence officers. There hadn't been a homicide task force established in Victoria since 2007, when one was set up to look into the murder of Shane Chartres Abbott. They were going to be operating out of Glen Waverley Police Station, and they knew that it was going to be a difficult task, with one detective stating, It's like looking for gold with the old pans. You've got to keep putting your pan in the water to get the nuggets. Fred said that most nights, Vanita sat up late waiting for an update on her daughter's whereabouts but said that they had returned to work, were eating, and were still living and functioning. He said that they continued to pray each morning and night and made sure to visit the temple. He stated, Our beliefs, we believe in karma, and we're good people, and she's a good person, and she's a very lovable girl. So if someone is with her or does have her, we hope there's somebody there who sees that. He asked that if somebody had taken Bung to think about somebody they loved, whether that be their sister, wife, daughter, husband, whatever, and to have a conscience and let Bong come home. In the six months since Bong had vanished, investigators had spoken to more than 1,000 people, yet there were still no suspects. There was a media blitz for the six-month anniversary, and precautions were taken for the students in Bong's school. An assembly was held where the importance of media coverage in unsolved cases was explained. Later that month, it would have been Bung's 14th birthday. Over the next three months, there was no public movement in the case. But in March, Chief Commissioner Kay Lay said that there had been recent developments in the case, but he said that he could not disclose any more information. Just the following day, it would be released that the development was in relation to an anonymous tip that had come in. They released a statement directed at the anonymous person. It read, Investigators are keen to speak with the anonymous person who provided information that is of interest to them and are appealing for them to call back. There was no movement for a couple more months, but in April, investigators said that they had been unable to link Bung's disappearance with the Mr. Cruel case from 20 years back. Assistant Commissioner Steve Fontana, who had actually worked on the Mr. Cruel case, said that it was unlikely Mr. Cruel abducted Bung. He said, They're always the sort of things you look at, I personally don't think it's related, but we certainly wouldn't write it off. In the Mr. Krull case, they had been able to eliminate more than 27,000 suspects, and yet it remained unsolved. The one-year anniversary to Bung's disappearance rolled around in June of 2012. Her family would once again make a tearful plea for her safe return, with Fred addressing her abductor or abductors. He stated, Send her home. It's time now. The family misses her. We love you. Bung, we want you home. Bung, if you hear mum, come if back. you see mum, come back. Investigators on the task force revealed that they had even followed leads to Thailand and made inquiries there as well, but there was no evidence that could lead them to Bung. Towards the end of the month, there was a fresh new lead in the case. Somebody had come forward, finally after a year, to say that they had seen Bong around 130 metres away from her school on the morning that she disappeared. The sighting was significant because it indicated that Bong certainly had intended on going to school that morning, as opposed to bunking off. The new lead suggested that Bong was walking in Harcourt Road and crossed Paisley Avenue and was heading towards Monco Street. This was at around 8.55am. She was really close to her school when she vanished 
which narrowed where she disappeared from down. With the new development, investigators announced that they now believed the bunk had been abducted by somebody who lived in the area. They once again appealed for people in the area to come forward if they had seen anything or heard anything out of the ordinary that morning. None of the tips ever panned out, and it appeared as though the case had gone cold. Then in April of 2013, it was disclosed that a man had been questioned in relation to Bung's disappearance. 62-year-old Robert Keith Knight had been due to face court on charges of possessing almost 10,000 images of child sexual abuse. He had previously served 15 years in prison for the abduction and rape of two schoolgirls. In 1996, he had held a knife to a 12-year-old girl's throat as she walked home from school, placed a bag over her head and shoved her into his car. Robert drove the terrified girl to a house where he forced her to put on lingerie, drugged her and abused her over the course of 18 hours, recording his acts. She was then taken to a school where Robert handed her $5 and told her not to look back. This case had been linked to a 1980 abduction, wherein a young girl was abducted under similar circumstances. In this case, Robert drove the girl to a secluded area and took explicit photographs before dropping her off nearby. Once again, he gave the girl money and told her not to look back. Robert first of all denied the accusations against him, before admitting to his wife that he was guilty. He pleaded guilty, but then he took his own life in Melbourne Remand Centre by jumping from the upper levels prison unit. Investigators said that they had questioned him in relation to Bung's disappearance. At the time, he had been living in Ferntree Gully, which was around three kilometres away from where Bung had vanished. He had been released from prison on the 12th of March 2009, and just days after his release, he began to re-offend. He had been interviewed by investigators and he provided an alibi, which initially ruled him out. However, when Task Force Puma was set up, they looked into him as a suspect once again and they found out that his alibi had been discredited. For a while, he had been a top suspect in Bunk's disappearance, but following his suicide, it was announced that he was no longer a suspect. Robert, however, was announced to be a suspect in the Mr. Cruel case. He had been a suspect for a number of years and investigators were never able to rule him out. In a bid to generate interest, as the second anniversary of Bung's disappearance was fast approaching, investigators announced that they were going to be running an information caravan at Baronia Mall and they asked anybody with any information to come forward. Two years had been a long time for the family to wait for answers and Fred would state in the media that they still believed that Bung was alive, possibly being kept hidden away. Fred said, The only sort of thing we have thought is somebody's taken her against her will. She's always such a, you know, lovable thing. It's hard to comprehend that anybody would actually want to hurt her and stuff. There's a lot of weird, crazy bad people around here. I know, and I'm not being unrealistic that it couldn't happen, but I have to believe that once they know what she's like, they treat her with some sort of dignity and respect. He said that the family has had to cope with the scrutiny of the police and the public, revealing that Vanita had never returned home from Thailand. The couple were still together and they spoke almost daily on the phone, but Vanita felt as though she had closer family ties back in Thailand and it helped her cope with the disappearance of her daughter that little bit easier. Fred said that he'd been scrutinised simply because he was Bung's stepfather, but Fred had always loved Bung like she was his own daughter. He said, People saying things. People still ring up maybe saying things. It all gets proven wrong, so I have no control over what people think or what over people say. I don't let it get to me. I know who I am. I know what I've done and I haven't done. And for what other people want to say, I know in myself that I'm a good person. I have done nothing wrong. Shortly after the two-year anniversary, investigators embarked on Old Joe's Creek which is in Melbourne's outer east. The reserve spanned around 22,000 metres and the search would take days to complete. The area was less than two kilometres away from where Bung was last seen and it was replete with dense brush, rocks and a creek. The area was very popular among walkers, but much of it was hidden away by vegetation. Investigators didn't disclose why they were searching this specific area, other than to say that new information had led them to the search. 
but it was noticed that they were assisted by cadaver dogs and excavation machinery. The following morning, a bone was recovered from the murky creek. Over the course of the next hour, more bones would be recovered. Fear, and maybe even a little bit of relief, emanated in the air as whispers began to circulate that Bung's body had been found. However, it wasn't meant to be, and a couple of hours later, it was determined that the bones belonged to an animal. The search at Old Joe's Creek would last around a week, but ultimately, it was unfruitful. Other than some animal bones and items of clothing that were unrelated to Bung's disappearance, there was no sign of the teenage girl or nothing to indicate what had happened to her. Then in October of 2013, almost two and a half years after Bung had disappeared, it was announced that Task Force Puma was being closed down. Investigators announced that this did not mean that they were giving up on their search for Bung. The Homicide Squad were still going to be investigating the case. Since Bung disappeared, they had interviewed more than 250 registered sex offenders, canvassed more than 1,000 homes, and investigated more than 1,100 pieces of evidence. When the creek was being searched, investigators didn't disclose what information had led them there, but the public would come to learn that a 24-year-old man had claimed to them that he accidentally run Bung over and then disposed of her body at the creek. The man was a local man and he had been arrested twice in relation to Bung's disappearance, first in August and then again in October. It was revealed that he was a person of interest, but apparently there were a handful of persons of interest but investigators said that it was not appropriate for them to comment any further. They did reveal, however, that items had been removed from the man's home to be forensically tested. Early the next year, a reward fund of $1 million, as well as the chance of immunity from prosecution, was offered for information that could lead to a conviction over Bong's disappearance. It was revealed that there were two men of interest, but there was not enough evidence for an arrest warrant for either. Skip forward to June, almost three years to the day that Bung disappeared. A man came forward to say that he may have seen Bung on the day she vanished. New information describes a young Asian girl sitting in the back seat of a white Ford station wagon, which was seen in Baronia Road at the corner of Floriston Avenue, between 8.30 and 9 o'clock that day. The witness said that he'd been stopped at a traffic light in Baronia when he saw a young girl of Asian appearance wearing a light shirt and a dark blue V-neck jumper. The girl was in the back seat of a white EA to EF model Ford Falcon. The car was being driven by a fair-skinned man estimated to be in his late 30s or early 40s. He was either bald or had light hair and sleeve tattoos on both arms, as well as a large tattoo on the left side of his neck. They were travelling east along Baronia Road and then continued over the roundabout at Albert Road. As the witness said, That didn't fit. There was something very odd about that. While it had not been confirmed whether the girl in the car was bung, it was a lead that investigators were desperate to follow up on. Detective Inspector Potter said, The sighting may well be completely innocent, but it's relevant to us and we need to investigate it. Ahead of the fifth anniversary of Bung's disappearance, her school honoured her with a plaque that light ups at night. As the principal said, it is to guide Bung home. Under the image of a butterfly with Bung's name and the date she vanished is the inscription, The light will guide you home. Meanwhile, investigators would appeal once more for information about the tattooed man. They gave a more detailed description of the sighting. While it was initially reported that the girl who looked like Bung was sitting in the back seat, it was now reported that she was sitting in the front seat. The car was described in more detail as a white station wagon similar to a 1971 to 1973 Holden GQ Kingwood with no rear seats or with them folded down. Investigators had wanted to exhaust all of their inquiries before asking the public for more assistance, with Inspector Hugh stating, We are asking the public to connect the description, the tattoo and the car. If all those pieces of information come together, we are going to be in a far better position. The family are looking for an answer. Unfortunately, the appeal didn't generate any lucrative tips, and in 2017, 
Investigators tried another method to generate some much-needed leads in the now cold case. Civic Guides Media donated billboards in Melbourne and the surrounding suburbs for investigators to display images of missing persons, including Bung. Later that same year, a mural of Bung was painted at Hosier Lane by artist Ashley Goody in the hopes that it would refresh the public's mind. It was part of the Unmissables project, which was run by the Missing Persons Advocacy Network. A renewed attempt to find Bong came in May of 2018, when the Missing Persons Advocacy Network launched a campaign called Invisible Friends. The campaign used facial recognition and auto-tagging technology via Facebook to try and detect her face on photographs and videos shared online. People were encouraged to add the profile of Bong, which would cast the net of connections wider. If a missing person's face was detected, then Facebook would automatically tag the profile and notify the missing person's advocacy network. Once again, with all earlier attempts to find Bung, it was unsuccessful. Bung Siraboon still remains missing today. Fred still lives in the family home at Baronia where Bung had packed her school bag that one final time before leaving for the short walk to school. In May of 2021, he said to the Sunday Herald, We've got to believe that she's still alive. We can't believe otherwise. We are all waiting for her to return. Everyone misses her, and the door's always open. It's not an anniversary for me. This is every day for us. It's ten years. It doesn't get any easier. Fred and Vanita are still together, although Vanita lives in Thailand. The memories in Australia are still too tough for her to bear, but the couple still chat daily, and Fred makes sure to visit any chance he gets. Sadly, his visits were cut back drastically with COVID restrictions. Fred also shared his belief that Bung would probably have become a doctor, a nurse, or a vet.